Hold up sailors, we're not done yet. Just when I woke up this morning after we finished talking about the character progression, Amazon decided to go complete ham on us and drop the crafting developer blog. Another one we've been waiting for for a little while now and it's got a lot of the detail I was hoping for. It's time yet again to break it down so let's get right to it. I want to start off by showing you guys a full picture of the trade skills we talked about yesterday. It gives us a little bit more insight as to how the trade skill UI is going to look, along with further supporting the fact that we truly are able to max out just about everything. Now to start diving deeper, the crafting blog begins by letting us know that when we arrive on Eternum, we will immediately face challenges to overcome. We'll have to assess our surroundings, find resources to gather and harvest, and start crafting tools to ensure our survival. Jumping a bit ahead, the blog's first important topic goes over how the crafting skills also feature a resource efficiency system. So for example, an arcanist could try to craft 50 healing tinctures or an engineer could make 50 arrows. Someone who's just a beginner in the craft might yield a 1 to 1 ratio, but it's stated that an expert could get a bonus. So for an advanced arcanist, they might get an extra yield of 30% on top of what they were already intending to craft. The same bonus applies to equipment crafting but works in a different way. They say the better we become at crafting equipment, the better the equipment will be. As shown in the screenshot, when we start progressing a crafting trade skill that creates equipment with the scaling gear score, the overall potential gear score outcome begins to expand. For example, as a starter weaponsmith, the gear score for iron swords we create might vary between 200 and 210 for a tier 2 weapon by default. And as we know, the gear score of equipment goes hand in hand with how many perks it'll have plus how powerful they will be. As our weaponsmithing increases, so will the gear score range on lower tiered items. Let's say I start off as a level 10 engineer and I make a musket of 205 gear score at tier 2. When I get to 50 or 70 or 100 engineering, I might be making that same musket in the range of 250 all the way up to 300 plus as shown in the screenshot example. The blog then states that once we arrive at the next material tier, which would be steel in this case, that we then again start off at the low end range, which appears to be starting around 300 to 310 for steel and possibly 400 to 410 for the next tier. So once we get close to or past the threshold of making steel, that's when we get to the point where we can start making higher quality, lower tier items. This means that even though it does have that influence of RNG, you're still able to take a large amount of it into your own hands to ensure you can craft really good equipment. That's why having things like housing trophies and food buffs is going to be very important as a crafter, to make sure that when you're trying to make high tier items, you come out with the best possible result in the end. They further this example by saying that a skilled weaponsmith could craft an iron sword that is more powerful than a base steel sword, which is a really good thing too, because since each tier is only locked by a level requirement, a high level smith can gear out a level 15 in all purple or blue gear instead of the default gray and green. By the way, I couldn't help but notice that house in the background. I'm not sure if that's a hat tip to some sort of company or guild house system in the future, or if that's just a really big three-story house, but I'm really hoping we get at least some kind of governor house or guild house system in the future. Would also really help with providing an incentive for taking over territories. And to get back on topic, anytime we craft a piece of equipment, we have a small chance of getting one or more perks randomly through the process. Along with that, we will also have a chance of occasionally getting equipment with the gem socket on it. Even though both of these bonuses are random, there are some ways we can gain control over the process. So if we want a higher chance of proccing a gem slot on a crafted piece for instance, the way we do that is through allocating more of the main resource to the final product. For example, we have this shield here, and the craftsman is able to dump more ori calcum ingots into the recipe to generate a higher gem slot chance. This is going to be something you're going to want to save for high-end gear. Best thing to do when leveling your craft is just focus on spam crafting as much as you possibly can, without wasting too many resources. If there's a salvage function, we'll want to make sure to use that too, but since there's no guaranteed results on the gem slot, it might be better to play it safe until you're making top tier items. For perks on the other hand, we can influence them too. The way we do this is through spending the resource called Azoth. Doing this, like shown in the picture, will increase our chances of getting a perk on the item we craft. And while we're on the subject, the resource Azoth is probably ringing a bell or two. This is the resource we recently learned more about. It's used for helping us respec our weapon mastery skill trees. One way we know we can get it is through corrupted invasions. Since the corrupted breaches are also connected to those, I'd be willing to bet that we get them from there too. But one thing I'd like to draw your attention to is the recent clip that Amazon posted on Twitter with their announcement of the crafting blog. It shows us a sneak peek of how we'll be using our gathering, refining, and crafting skills, which is very good. But what I'd like to draw your attention to is this mob kill. Couldn't help but notice that it pans down to show us the rewards, which of course we see gold, experience, weapon mastery, and territory standing. But hey, look at the top. 
Azoth. This tells us right away that one of the main and probably the best way to get this resource will be through farming mobs. So for crafters, this only further solidifies the opinion I had that we should definitely be leveling up a decent amount before going too deep into crafting. That way, once you need to get some Azoth for increasing equipment perk chance, you won't have as tough of a time. Couldn't help but notice that the maximum amount we can dump in is 100, and we just saw this character get 10 from that mob, so I think it's safe to say we won't have to worry too much about it when it comes to farming this up. Plus, the cap for Azoth seems to go higher than 100 if we judge by this screenshot, so we should be able to rack up a decent stockpile before we come back to town. Also, unrelated, look at this guy's gold. Let that be an incentive for all you crafters out there. Would be so cool to actually see someone reach this amount over time. Also, it appears that along with spending Azoth to increase the perk chance, just like we talked about before, there are also special resources we can find if we're aiming to get a specific perk. This means we'll be able to see what the full list of perks are before we even have to decide on a character's direction. They say that while exploring, we might come across something like a Dragon Glory plant. This plant is primarily used for gathering fire essence, which is a critical component used by Arcanus when crafting potions and fire staffs. But also, when we harvest these, there's a small chance we'll gain a resource called Dragon Glory Stem. And yep, just like the name suggests, this is the one that gives us a higher chance of getting the Ignited perk, for all you flaming sword lovers out there. While we can't control the total outcome of the items, we can at least guarantee that one perk we want is on there. Which thank goodness for that, because that does alleviate a lot of crafting RNG. They say there are a wide variety of crafting modifiers, and they are rare, even though they come from multiple different sources. While we're out gathering from trees, from ore, skinning, or even harvesting. But also, I want to stop there because we found out before that we can get special resources while slaying creatures or searching the abandoned settlements, temples, and corrupted camps. So that gives us many different avenues for obtaining the perks we're looking for. Far, far better way to go about it than just repeatedly crafting and hoping we get the perk we want. At least this way we have some sort of controlled method of reaching that peak of endgame we're working for. In this example, they show us some perks for the shield item, but I would highly recommend taking a look at all of it. As soon as you get in game, look at the weapon perks, the armor perks, jewelry, everything. That way you'll have a much better idea of where you want to take your character as soon as possible. On this next picture, we can see an example of what a crafted item looks like. And yep, I see we have ourselves a salvage method. So while leveling your crafting, I would highly recommend to consider making use of this if it gives you back some materials. We can also see the gear score threshold, which seems to suggest that this character can craft between 500 and 600 at level 58 weaponsmithing. And the most important thing to take from this is that because the Ori Calcum shield is considered tier 5, also known as in-game equipment, we can deduce from this that around 600 or maybe slightly higher is where the in-game gear scores are going to come into play. So early on in the game's release, we might not see people going over about 650 or 700 gear score. And the second thing to look at is that once you get to around level 58 weaponsmithing, you're already making tier 5 gear. This means that one, it might take quite a while to get to that point to begin with, and two, because this person isn't at 60 yet, the crafting levels probably go in increments of 10 or 20. So for crafting tier 2, it's probably between level 0 and 20, since tier 2 gear starts at level 1. For tier 3, it's probably 20 to 30, and this gets further supported by that clip we talked about, where it shows at the bottom that this person has level 23 weaponsmithing, and they qualify for crafting tier 3. And then tier 4 could be anywhere from 30 to 40, or maybe it jumps up and goes 40 to 50, and then tier 5 goes 50 plus. It's probably at least pretty close to that from what we've seen so far. And the last thing we get to touch on from the blog, the one that I'm predicting might end up being one of the best, if not the best way to make money long term for crafting. In New World, they want our houses to feel like a home. This means we need to have some way to decorate and furnish our houses. This one works a little bit differently than the other crafting skills from what they say. They wanted to make sure that there was a variety of furniture items that could be crafted, while at the same time making sure there wasn't a huge barrier for players just wanting to decorate their houses, which I certainly have to praise because that is something I was afraid of when it came to the cash shop. Previously, they said in interviews that they wanted to have a cosmetic only one, but also have decorations for our house. This tells us that it's probably just going to be decoration skins or additional furniture items, which hopefully won't be as bad as if we had to buy them all to begin with. 
As a result of this though, they say that decorations can be crafted at a very low furnishing level. In addition to that, we can also craft the trophies and the storage as we talked about previously. And this blog does confirm that the storage items you place in your home, they actually do increase the storage volume of your personal bank. And considering everyone's probably going to want those, I'd say that those of you that plan on choosing this profession could probably sell these like hotcakes. And for the trophies, we finally get a good look at what the tooltip of these look like. It's hard to guess what all of them are, but I would imagine the one with two knives is for skinning, and the one at the end there might be for Arcanist, since we know that these trophies will give us passive buffs for combat and crafting. Looks like the furnishing stuff is crafted at the same bench we make engineering items at, and this shows us a few of the furniture items we'll be making. Also have to give props to whoever decided to put wall and table lights in the roster. Sometimes you just can't decorate a house in the fanciest way possible without proper lighting. Plus that scroll bar looks to only be at about halfway down, so we might end up seeing even more furniture items than what we have here. Would not be opposed to crafting a fireplace and maybe an outdoor garden, but I'm not picky. Although having a house farm system of some kind doesn't sound too bad either. Same thing goes for fishing ponds. But with that folks, that is everything we need to know about the crafting system. The blog finishes by saying that highly skilled crafters can make items that are just as powerful as those found in Eternum. Let's hope that includes legendaries by the way. And they say battles should not be won based off whether the item was crafted or dropped by a powerful creature, but instead they'll be won based on the skill of the players involved and the work we put into our attribute and mastery builds. So there we have it, crafting in its entirety. Now we'll just have to see how it functions with all of us in game. Now that you know a little bit more about it, what kind of craft do you think you'll have as your main when we first get into beta? I think I'll probably start with weaponsmithing a bit, and then probably do some furnishing on the side, especially with how useful those trophies are going to be when it comes to getting high gear scores. Let us all know in the comments below. And as always, thank you very much for taking the time to check out this video, have a wonderful night or day, and farewell.